Man, we serve a good God, don't we? How about we worship him like, we, like he is, right? Let, let's stand together. We're going to sing a song called What I See. We taught you guys this one a few months ago, and I love this song. Let's sing it together. I see 
Amen. Hey, man, you guys may be seated this morning. So David and I were talking this last week, um, and uh, we were talking about the, the, the church getting all decorated and everything for Christmas, and, and as we were discussing that, an, an idea popped into our minds. Um, I've always thought it would be fun uh, to have the outside of the church decorated, because I love Christmas lights. I don't know about you, but I genuinely do love Christmas lights. And so uh, we, we got to talking. We came up with a plan, but you, it, it involves you. Um, so it, it'll happen or it won't. Totally up to you guys, really, is, is what we're ultimately saying here. Um, and so what we're thinking is, you know, like if you're from Brazil, then you know over at the park, they have different businesses and stuff sponsor each of these little bitty areas around the park for, to decorate it, right? You've seen that? We thought it would be super fun to have families just decorate a little section of the outside of the church. Uh, we have a couple outlets on the outside of the building. We're working on getting another one put in. We'll figure out how to plug it all in later. I'm not worried about that. Um, so we'll, we'll figure that out, I promise. We'll figure that out. Uh, so if you would like to participate in that, uh, if your family would like to decorate a little corner of the church or decorate the drop-off or just put some lights around, whatever, uh, we just think it would be super, super fun um, to do that and give get people another reason to potentially drive by our building, and who knows? Who knows who might stop by uh, because of something as simple as that. And so, uh, as you can see, um, it's, it's not a specific thing. What we're looking for is if we got some people interested in it, we'll try it this year. And then if, it, if people think this is a good idea, yeah, maybe we do something special with it next year um, to involve as, as many people as we can and maybe even designate a date to do it and things like that. So, so just, if, if you, just think about that as a family. If that's something you like to do, um, then, man, that would be a, a super, super neat thing uh, to do around the church. All right? Uh, I've got two other things that I want to share with you. Uh, one, last week our very own Pam Floyd um, brought to us an opportunity for us to participate in the prayer ministry here at the church. Uh, we met with her, Ken and I did a few, uh, actually, probably a couple months ago, at this point, and she had this desire to start a prayer ministry at the church doing something very specific, and that is creating a prayer quilt, just like this one right over here. And um, last week, she kind of described it a little bit to you. Let me just do that again. Here's what we need. Um, first, if you're interested in doing such things, she would love to, love to, love to teach some more people to do some simple quilting and things like that so you can help with this process. But as things come up or opportunities uh, present themselves for us to specifically pray for a specific need for a specific person or family or something like that, then we want to give them one of these prayer quilts. And the way it'll work is we will assign that person a specific quilt. We'll bring it in. And last week we put it in the prayer room. I brought it up here on stage today so you could see it. And then what we ask is you to do this. After church or before church, whenever you have time to run in there and do it, we'll leave it right here for today. There's some strings that still need to be finished. Just a little simple double knot in these little strings. You'll see they're longer than the ones that have been tied. And as you tie that twice, they simply ask that you pray for the person that is getting this, this quilt. There's a little description there of who is getting it. Uh, Melvin Fagg is the one that's going to be receiving this. He always sat right outside there at that table, and he's just physically unable to come to church at this point in his life. And so we want to let him know that we're thinking of him, and we want to let him know that this, this simple blanket has been prayed over by everybody here. So it requires very little effort on our behalf to come in and to do something like this. But if you'd be interested in learning how to participate in that, she really wants some people. She's got a few ladies that... Uh, are uh, more experienced in life um, than others, and she would love to teach some less experienced ladies. Is that a nice way of saying that? Anyway, um, uh, we think we, we would love to involve some new people in these traits and in, in, in learning these skills in life. They're so cool to be able to do. All right. So anyway, that's what this is. I wanted to bring that out here because I just I don't think it got enough attention last week, and I wanted to get more attention. I really do. And so as I was walking through the prayer room, God said, "Hey, grab that." I said, "Oh, okay." And so there it is. Um, I brought it in here. All right. Lastly, Ken, this is this is your time to shine here. Um, next week is Thanksgiving. This coming week is Thanksgiving. Next Sunday is our Thanksgiving Sunday, if you will. And so we have a task that you need to perform today before you leave this building. Everybody. Okay, so you've got students assigned to help you? Yes. Yeah, students that are assigned to help Ken, please uh, come up to help Ken. All the blast students. The blast students that, that, that came to help Ken. Um, they're going to give you a card. It's a simple Thanksgiving card. Um, you are going to write something in life that you are thankful for. Okay? You're going to write something in life that you are thankful for. All right, we're going to use some of these next week. It's very important that you do this. And here's the thing. Everybody gets to do this. There's pens in the seat backs in front of you. So please, please, please do this. Um, Ken, I think I said it was going to um, basically not let you leave the doors until you've turned one of these cards in after service. So it's kind of your exit ticket, if you will, um, for, for this week. All right? So they're going to pass those out to everybody in the room. 
Um, yes, go ahead, go ahead, go right ahead, go right ahead, and, and, and pass away. So, go, pass. All right, so get that filled out today before you leave this service. Get that filled out, and uh, we'll collect them later on. Super important that you do that. It's for uh, next Sunday's service. By the way, our little memory verse for this whole series, 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You're simply physically putting down something that you were physically thankful for in this world right now. Okay? So that, that's all. We're not asking a lot. You don't have to write your life story or anything like that. Just something specific. You can put more than one, yes. But something specific that you're thankful for right now in this season of life. Okay? So take a moment and do that at some point in time during the service today. I'm so, I can't wait to read these tomorrow. Actually, I'll probably read them tonight quite honestly, when I come back with Corey for Youth Group. So I can't wait to read these. I'm just excited uh, to hear what God is doing in, in all of your lives right now. Um, and regardless of how close your relationship is or isn't with him, that's okay. You still have things to be thankful for in your life, and we know that all good gifts come from God. And so if you've never considered that reality, that gift, that thing you're thankful for, well, that's, that, was, that was from God. This week's message um, actually brings that verse to life very, very well. It's the gift of faith. The gift of faith. Did you know that faith is actually also listed as one of the spiritual gifts that could be given to us by God when we accept Jesus as, his, as our Lord and Savior? Did you know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is where you'll find this list, and faith is right in the middle of it. It begins in verse 7. Now to each one... The manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given the Spirit of a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To other, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous power. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between the Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To still another, the interpretation of those tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit. He distributes them each to, to each one just as he determines. Right there in the middle was that gift of faith. Now, this is a different kind of faith than necessarily what it takes to come to Christ. It's beyond that. It's a faith given to us by the Holy Spirit of God within us. The, the gift that displays God's powers in such a way that it actually creates joy in other people. It helps lead other people to our Jesus, this gift of faith. It's the faith that every, everyone that has accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, everyone who's confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart that God did indeed raise him from the grave, every one of us had at least one spiritual gift. Did you realize that? Did you know that? Remember, the gift you have, don't, don't look down on it or up. It doesn't make you better or worse than any other Christian. That's not it at all. Every spiritual gift is a blessing from God. An incredible blessing, actually, from God. So don't forget that. Don't forget that. Today we're talking about outrageous faith. Here, here's a truth about all spiritual gifts. We've, we've all been given them. Every one of us that's accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has been given spiritual gifts. However, we don't all put them on display. Some of us, we, we know our gifts. We, we know that God has called upon us to put these gifts to work for him. We know that. Some of us have an idea of maybe what those spiritual gifts might be, but we really, for one reason or another, have never put them into action. We've been hesitant to use them for his glory. For others of us, we know you're not really sure what your gift is yet. And, and you might have been a believer for a long time, and you, you're still just not sure. You haven't discovered what that spiritual gift is yet. Honestly, maybe some of us have never really tried. We just kind of accepted Christ and went on with life. We didn't dive in to figure out what it was that he was preparing us for. Please do this, this Christmas season that we're coming into. Don't ever, don't live your life with that gift, that present, unwrapped. Don't live your life with the spiritual gift God has given you unwrapped. Make sure, wrap all wrapped up your whole life. Make sure you unwrap it. If you haven't done it before, do it this holiday season. Because here's the thing. Our goal here, one of our goals is to empower you to serve God however he is calling you to serve him. To unwrap that spiritual gift, to put it to use for his glory. And part of the reason he gave you that gift was to bless his bride, the church, as well as to show love and his love to those people around you. 
Today we're going to look at that gift of faith. And some people in the Bible, some Old Testament and New Testament characters who had some outrageous faith, outrageous faith. The people that were called upon by God to have faith. Here's the thing. These weren't rich and famous people. These weren't extravagant people. These people were all people living very, very difficult lives, facing very difficult, awful, terrible situations, quite honestly. In some cases, their situation was life or death. And look at what God does through their faith. We're going to the Old Testament first. First Kings is where we're going to be to start with. First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. It begins with the, the great prophet Elijah. Some say the greatest prophet in the whole history of the Jewish faith. God had brought a great drought upon the northern kingdom of Israel for sure because of King Ahab and the awful things that he and his wonderful wife Jezebel were, were partaking in. Elijah had told them some bad news about this drought. He'd fled to this deserted desert area. And God promised to provide, first of all, ravens to feed him every day and a brook of water that would never run dry. But there's a time in this story where the brook does run dry and God gives Elijah a new plan, a new plan of action to help him survive. It begins in verse 8 of 1 Kings 17. It says, Then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, Elijah, Go at once to Zarephath, to the region of Sidon, and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was at the gate gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? Sure enough, she leaves. As she was going to get it, he called, Oh, and um, by the way, could you please bring me a piece of bread? All right, so, so God calls Elijah, tells him to go to this town to find this widow who is supposed to supply him with food. Seems like a great plan until he arrives, and this is her reply, verse 12. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil left in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Wait, wait, hold on. So, so God sent Elijah to the house of a widow who has absolutely nothing? <laughs> Can you imagine the desperation of the widow's situation? A, a nationwide drought resulting in this famine. The widow and her son were ready to fix their final meal <laughs> before they're literally left to die of starvation. Now, I know there are people around the world that are experiencing that very reality right now. We are blessed beyond measure in our country, and this very rarely will happen and probably has never happened to any of us listening today. So probably not many of us have been called to this level of faith in our God before. Think about what Elijah is asking this widow to do. He says to her, don't be afraid. Go home, do as you have said, but first, but first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. Then make some for yourself and your son, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up, the jug of oil will not run dry until the, Lord, the day the Lord send rain on the land. Elijah was a crazy man. This request, how could a widow give up her last meal, but honestly, not even her last meal? How could she give up the last meal for her child? This was her final attempt to hang on to life. By giving this final meal to him, they would be sacrificing their own lives to benefit this prophet, Elijah. What Elijah was asking to do was nearly impossible. There wasn't enough there for three cakes of bread, only the one. To give it up would mean death. But for some reason, she had faith. She had faith in the words of Elijah. She had faith in the God of Elijah that somehow what he told her to do would actually be possible. Verse 15, she went away, did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word the Lord spoken to Elijah. Now that is incredible faith to give up your last meal, your last chance at living in order to help someone else out. Now her God proved absolutely himself to be faithful for her and for her son. And her act of faith in providing for the prophet actually allowed God 
to even show her a greater sign very shortly thereafter. Think about the faith that she has. What about us? When our faith is tested, if we prove faithful like this widow did, how much more will God provide for us? This widow proved faithful in this situation, and God was asking her to do a great, great thing here. And listen to what happens in part B of her story. It says some time later, we, we don't know the exact time frame, but some time later her son fell ill and, and died. Her faith in this Lord that had provided obviously was shaken. I'm sure all of ours would be as well. She trusted in God. She provided for the prophet, and she had been blessed beyond measure. But tragedy still struck as it can in our lives as well. Her words to the prophet were harsh. They were cutting. They were sincere. She was full of pain. But God had another plan. God had another plan to solidify the faith of this poor widow who came to the aid of his prophet. She had great faith, and look what God provides for her. Verse 19, give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, laid him on his bed, cried out to God, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times, cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. Outrageous faith, but it took her faith at the beginning to provide her last meal to this prophet in order for her faith to be fully realized at the end as God resurrected her son back to life. It's a crazy story. Imagine having that kind of faith. The second story is actually very similar. It involves another widow. We're going to 2 Kings chapter 4 this time, so just one book further. This is with the great prophet Elisha. Now, as a child, I always got those two confused. Elijah, Elisha, they sound the same. They look the same. They basically did a lot of the same things. Elisha did more as he asked for God for a double blessing over Elijah. But Elisha was this second prophet. He was the one God called upon to take the place of Elijah. The woman in 2 Kings was married to a man that was actually following Elisha. He was one of his disciples, if you will. Her husband was part of a group that followed him around and trained under him to be a prophet and teacher of Israel. And when, she, when this, his, her husband passed away, um, it wasn't like she just lost her husband. That's, that's obviously the biggest blow. But she also lost her provider and her protector. She, she was at the very end of her rope, and then it got worse. And that's where we pick it up in 2 Kings chapter 4. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know he revered the Lord, but now his creditors have come to take away my two boys as slaves. She's lost her husband, her means to provide, and now she's about to lose her two sons as well. Elisha replied, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing, nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around, ask all of your neighbors for the empty jars they have. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into the jars, and as each is filled, put it to the side. Now this woman has lost nearly everything. She's about to lose her sons as well. She has absolutely nothing of value in her house at all except a very small jar of olive oil. <clears throat> Elijah's fix, well, his fix is for her to go meet a whole bunch of empty jars, as many as she can, and somehow fill them up. She's going to fill all these up with this tiny bit of oil that she has in her house. Does that seem a bit impossible to anyone else? I know if I were the widow in that situation, I would have had just a couple questions for Elisha, uh, starting with how is that going to work again exactly? Uh, is this much doesn't equal this. How is that going to happen? Verse 5, her faith, she left him. She shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought in the jars, as many as they could find. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another. But he replied, there's not a jar left. It says, then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go, sell the oil, pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. <laughs> 
she sent out her sons. They rounded up as many jars as they could find, and every one of them was filled to the top. Now, if you'll notice there, Elisha didn't even tell her why she was doing what she was doing. It wasn't until it was done that the purpose was revealed. Then he gave her the instructions. She obeyed. She went beyond. Once the task was performed, jars filled, he tells her, go sell everything. Sell all the oil, pay all of your debt, and oh, by the way, you'll have enough to left to live on. That's crazy. It's crazy. She didn't even know what she was going to be doing with the oil until Elijah, Elisha revealed that to her. All she saw was the situation before her. Her sons were going to be turned into slaves. So she believed, she had faith somehow that this God of Elisha could provide for her needs. What would it take for you and I to have that much faith in the Lord, our provider? Think about that. Outrageous faith in the New Testament. I'm going to give you three quick, short, simple examples. One from Matthew, one from Mark, and one from Luke. In each of these miracles, Jesus calls out the individual person's faith. Matthew chapter 9 shares the story of a woman who approached Jesus. She's, he's, he's in the middle of this huge crowd pressing in on him. He'd just been called by the synagogue leader named Jairus. His daughter had fallen ill. A little bit later in the story, we find out she had actually died. Jesus was leaving this crowd to go and heal this girl, resurrect this girl. And then he stopped, dead in his tracks in the middle of this crowd. And he, he felt his power had left him somehow. His disciples tried to convince him, Jesus, you're crazy. There's just people pressing in. How could you know if someone touched you? Lots of people are touching you. But a sick woman, unbeknownst to everybody else, had snuck up, touched the very edge of Jesus' cloak. She had enough faith to believe that all she had to do was touch Jesus' clothes and he would heal her, even if he never even knew she was there. Now, that's a crazy amount of faith. And that's exactly what had happened. Jesus' words, Matthew 9, verse 22, Jesus turned and he saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed in that moment. She had faith that Jesus would heal her, an outrageous amount of faith that led her to believe that all she needed to do was touch his clothes. Turns out she was right. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, there's a blind man named Bartimaeus. He is on the roadside begging in Jericho. He heard that Jesus was coming, that Jesus was going to pass by. He began to cry out, Jesus, son of David. Now, how did he know who this was? Well, there was a there was, you know, he could hear people talking that this Jesus of Nazareth was coming his way. But how did he know who Jesus was? Jesus, son of David. He was using Jesus' messianic title, Jesus' own disciples, the people closest to Jesus, did not call him Jesus, son of David. No one else did. This blind man had this incredible faith that this man was indeed the coming Messiah. And as he shouted to Jesus, all the people around him began to tell him to shut his mouth. Be quiet. Leave him alone. He doesn't need to bother with you. What did he do? He shouted even louder, it says, until he got Jesus' attention. And Jesus sent for him. Chapter 10, verse 49 so they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He, Jesus, is calling you. So he threw his cloak aside. He jumped to his feet. He came to Jesus. And Jesus asked him a question. What do you want me to do for you? Now that question should sound very familiar because it's basically the exact same question that Elisha just asked that widow. Jesus already knows the man's physical needs. He knows he's blind. It's obvious. <clears throat> so why did Jesus ask? <coughs> If the man will not tell Jesus what he needs, think about this. If the man will not tell Jesus exactly what he needs, then does he believe that Jesus can really heal him? If you're afraid to ask, do you believe that God can actually provide? The blind man said to Jesus, Rabbi, I want to see. <laughs> no hesitation. I want to see. He has an outrageous faith that leads him to believe that somehow this Jesus can heal him. That outrageous faith allows him to be healed. Jesus tells the man, go, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. He didn't go anywhere. He stayed actually. 
with Jesus. That's how we all need to come to Jesus, with that kind of faith, a faith believing that God will hear us and believing that he will act according to his will. What will God do in our lives if we have that kind of faith? You've heard these examples so far. Are we even willing to tell Jesus what it is we specifically need? Do we have the faith it takes to believe that Jesus will provide what we need? The final example of outrageous faith, this time is from Luke. We, we studied it in Luke quite a while ago. It's funny that as God brought this passage to my mind, I didn't realize at the moment that it was a perfect segue into next week's message. Outrageous Thanksgiving, which you're filling out a card on today. Let me show you. This case is another case of, of a group of people this time with no hope, no hope at all. They lost everything but their physical life. Much like the widow earlier, nearly everything had been taken away from these, these people. This time, it's a disease. The disease was called leprosy back in their time, whether it was the same as ours, yeah, probably not, but it was a skin disease. The men in this story were all lepers. Their disease had let, made them leave their entire life behind. They were banished from their families, their homes, their communities, really from society altogether to live together on the outskirts of towns. Luke chapter 17 is where you find this story. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's traveling on the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. They called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. When Jesus saw them, he said, go, go, show yourselves to the priests. And they went. And as they went, they were cleansed. This group of men were desperately crying out to Jesus. They've likely never been near Jesus or actually ever seen any of the works of his hands at first, you know, in first person because they can't get near him because of their disease. But they cry out to Jesus. And when they do, Jesus gives them some absurd instructions. It's crazy. Unbelievable instructions. It makes no sense. They aren't even allowed to go to the temple, let alone meet with a priest but it appears that all 10 of them had faith that Jesus would indeed have the pity on them that they're requesting and heal them. Now, I shared this during the Luke series, but it, I had to share it again. As the men, as they turned from Jesus and they began to head into town toward the temple, as they went along the road, they began to be healed. The men had to leave. They had to have faith to do what Jesus asked them to do, believing that he would heal them. And I don't think it happened instantly. It didn't say it happened instantly. It said, as they went along, it happened. Can you imagine being in that group of 10 men, walking toward and looking at each other, noticing all of a sudden that their skin is beginning to heal. The scars are going away. The pain is going away. The flesh is all healing. They would have seen it happening on each other's bodies as they traveled. Imagine the rejoicing that began to take place as they started to see this happen. Imagine them going faster and faster and faster. I got to hurry up and get to the temple. I got to get there. I got to get there. I got to thank God for this. I got to talk to the priest. I got to get back to my family. I got to get back to my job. I got to get back to whatever. Imagine all the plans that these men were making, thinking about everything they would now be able to do as they return to their families. No more judgment from others. No more exclusion from society. No more begging from others. How excited would they have been as they made their way to the priest? They were all planning their futures, moving on with their lives. And then one of them stopped, it says. One of them fully realized everything that was happening. I believe this man was overcome with emotion in that moment. He had to be. He could not have been just, oh, well, yeah, this is kind of cool. It says that he's now left this life that was full of pain and suffering and rejection. Everything had changed. As a result of his cry for help, he had an encounter with Jesus. He had faith that Jesus could heal him physically, but there was more. The passage says he stopped when he realized all of this. He went back to Jesus and he threw himself at the feet of Jesus. He was completely overcome. He couldn't believe he had actually been healed. A dream, impossible dream, had just come true. 
He can't believe he gets this new life. He can't believe that a Jewish rabbi would even heal him in the first place because we find out that this man happens to be a Samaritan. The other nine, oh, they went on their way rejoicing. Absolutely, technically speaking, they were following Jesus' directions, right? Going to the temple to talk to the priests, just like Jesus commanded them. But one came back after that to praise Jesus. The others, they all went ahead with their new life in Christ, the new life that they'd, he'd been given to them. But one came back to praise the one who gave him this new life. Here's the key. Nine of them resumed their old lives miraculously healed. One began a brand new life in Jesus. This is where the conversation ensues, verse 17, where Jesus asks him, we're not all, nine, the other, all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine people at? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. I think in this country, we could look around and ask the question, are we all that gather on a Sunday morning to give thanks and praise to our God in a country of 350 million people, whatever we are now? Less than 50%, less than 30% are probably in a church this morning worshiping, praising their God. Where are the other Nine. Where's everyone at? God asks. This man's transformation was more than physical. He was now this new creation in Christ Jesus. His body and life both transformed. His faith in Jesus had changed everything. It was outrageous faith he had, followed by an outrageous reward. Let's recap a couple of these folks. First, the widow. To step out in faith and help Elijah to give up her last meal would have been death for herself and for her son, but it actually brought life in the moment for food and resurrection life later with her son as God demonstrated his power over death even in the Old Testament as her son was brought back to life. It's an incredible story. Will we as individuals pour out what is left in our jar believing that God will provide more. God will come to us. He will ask us, will you help with this? Will you provide in this way? Will we continue to pour out believing that he is going to provide more? Or will we just take what we have and say, nope, this is mine. And when it's gone, it's gone. The second widow was sent out to get empty jars with no way to fill them whatsoever. She had a tiny jar of oil with nothing in it, but she had faith that God would move through Elisha to fill those jars that she collected. Now, these two individual stories, I think, might be a representation. The miracles represented in these two stories, I think, just might be a representation of us, the bride here at Berea. Let me explain. I want to be part of a church that takes our small jar, we're not a giant church, that takes our small jar and just keeps pouring it out to bless those people around, just keeps pouring out, to reach out to this community around, just keeps pouring. When it's impossible, we just keep pouring it out, knowing that God will provide more. He knows what we need. He knows what we need to do. He's giving us things to go and do. He's given us an incredible vision to share with you. Over the next few weeks, I'll begin revealing some pieces of that. But if we follow God down some of these paths, then the world around us is going to look at us, this little church that sits out here on a corner, and say, oh, those people are crazy. There's no way they could possibly accomplish those goals in this community. As a matter of fact, I'll just warn you, there are some people that are a part of this bride of Christ that will doubt that it's even possible to accomplish. There's some who will look at this, within this church, and look at the things God is calling us to do, and say, no. Now, that's impossible. There's no way. They'll see the jar that we have and have no idea how we can fill anything else up. Our jar is so small. <laughs> yeah. It's not our jar, kids. It's his. He's in charge of it, not us. I want to be a part of a church that just keeps bringing in the jars, trusting that God's going to fill them. We don't know how but he's going to fill them. He's going to fill them. He's going to fill them. Are you with me? I hope and pray that you are. We trust that God, like for the widow, will provide what we need to follow his will for this body here. 
no matter what. Church, God is asking us to do some things right now that, that really probably don't make a whole lot of sense in life, in this world that we live in. I need, the leadership needs all of us to be praying very specifically about where God is directing us, where he is leading us. As I said, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be sharing some of the things we found from you this last summer in our discovery meetings throughout the summer. I can't wait. Some of these things that God has revealed to you place in your heart, some of these things are outrageous for sure. <laughs> We're going to have to bring in a lot of jars. Okay. Are you willing are you willing to have that kind of outrageous faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he will provide everything that we need to accomplish his will in this world? Boy, I hope you are. I hope you are, because it's exciting to be a part of God's plan. It really is. That's why I love what I get to do with all of you. If you've not come to know this God yet, this God of outrageous, outrageous generosity, this God of outrageous love for each and every one of you, if you've not come to know him in a personal relationship yet, would you do that today? This Thanksgiving, what an awesome, awesome opportunity to finally kind of realize, oh, there's more to this life. Oh, there's a reason I'm here. There's a reason I'm listening today. And that's so this God through his spirit can get a hold of me and I can recognize him for who he is in my life and I can give him thanks for all that he has done, is doing, and will do in me, to me, through me in this world. Folks, we have some incredible things ahead of us. I know we do. You know why? Because that we're his. He, has, he does have good plans for us. He has absolutely things for us into his future as we attempt to reach those around us. We pray that you will all be all in. Don't miss the next few weeks. We got Christmas coming up too. I mean, it's just gonna be an incredible. I can't wait to share with you outrageous vision in a couple weeks. I mean, it's just gonna be, I, I just can't wait. It's so exciting. Hopefully you feel the excitement just a little bit. If not, shake my hand on your way out. Maybe I'll give you a little bit, all right? I'll just give you a little touch. Father God, as we come before you this morning, we are outrageously thankful for who you are, for what you've done. Father, for what you're doing right now. And, and Father, I think sometimes in our world we get distracted by the world around us and we forget that you have great plans for us ahead. Father, the greatest of those plans, of course, is being in your presence for all eternity. And we long for that day, but Father, we can't live on this earth just longing for that day. That moment has already begun. We've already stepped into eternity whenever we came to you and received your spirit. Father, our eternity is with you. It began today. It began now. If we've never accepted you before, right now we can step into that eternity with you. And Father, while we're here on this earth, we need to not worry about the future. We don't need to worry about where you are, how you, you're here. You're with us. You're in us right now. We can look around the world. We can be depressed by the things that are happening. We can be upset at those things. Or we can look at the world. We can remember the spirit that we have inside of us and go, okay, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Father, we see these examples of, of Jesus just looking at the blind man who, who can't look back at him, can't see him, and ask him just, hey, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man says the obvious, I want to see Jesus. <laughs> Father, I pray that we as believers will look at you this morning and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? What are you calling me to do? What are you calling us to do as believers? Lead us, guide us, direct us. We know you will provide. There is no dream too big for you. There is no task that you cannot accomplish. You know the needs of this body. You know the needs of this community. You know the needs of those around the world that you're designing for us to reach out to through our missions. I can't wait to see those things become a reality in our midst. I can't wait for everyone here today to be a part of that. I can't wait for them to invite their friends, their neighbors, their loved ones, their coworkers to come and be a part of your family here as we pursue you with all that we are, as we pour from our little jar, knowing that as we pour, you're gonna fill it up faster than we can pour it. If we fully follow you, that's all that we long 
to do. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It comes to this time of the service where we're going to take communion. Um, we're going to have somebody coming by, I think. Ken's walking by if you guys don't have a communion, a portion. He'll be walking through the aisle. I want to talk to you from about Paul because he wrote beautifully of the authority of the Lord's table. But he also sat right there the same as us today. Was he worthy? Are we? See, both of us are worthy for the Lord's table today because he's invited us here. Paul certainly had sins when he sat here. His tears of repentance were not imagined and he missed the mark of God's righteousness. Paul wasn't worthy from a human, from a human perspective. And certainly you've sat here, you and I, with our sins. Any tears were not fake. And we've sat here sometimes with the image of the one that we failed to have the conversation about the gospel with. But he's calling us today. Without exception, sit at his table still. We both know, as Paul did, that we are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And <laughs> it's good. These emblems before us wipe away our doubting. We can look at ourselves and allow us to see the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And we can sit here at his table and taste his cup at knowing full assurance of what his life did, meant for us because he alone made us worthy. for us. And this juice representing his blood shed for us so we can have eternal life. You guys are ready. Please stand. We're going to sing a few songs today just of praising our Lord today before we leave. My 
trust what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life Man, I love this outrageous series. We are outrageously blessed. We are outrageously chosen. We are outrageously called. I pray that we all take that outrageously to the extent that we can. Men's ministry coming up December 11th. You've got those outrageously thankful cards. If you forgot to fill them out, because that was like an hour ago that we talked about that. If you forgot to fill those out, go ahead and fill them out real quick, but listen to what I have to say. Uh, Christmas Eve service, December 24th. Mark that on your calendar. It's the day before Christmas at 4.30. Um, Jerry and Tony uh, moved, and a group of us got together after church last Sunday, and we helped them unload their their U-Haul. They wanted to say thank you. And I wanted to say thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what our congregation is here for is to reach out and serve not to be served to reach out and serve um, blast the blast youth group is tonight there's one important thing I want your kids to bring to blast youth group tonight anybody guess what it is it's a Bible we're going to use those tonight we do it every Sunday but we're going to do it tonight again so please make sure your kid brings their Bible and Get them a paper Bible because when they pull this out, they get distracted and they start checking other things. I know that none of us adults, we, we never do that. But I want to make sure that when your kid's looking at the Bible that they're following what we're talking about, all right? Hey, if I could have all the Blast Youth Group come right up here for just a minute. Full of excitement. You know, in... <laughs> In one of the songs we sing today, it says, Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. We saw that last Sunday right here. We all have different thoughts of what we think Jesus looks like. But last week, we talked about those shoe boxes out there. And I saw Jesus. we have touched 50 lives with those boxes out there. 50 boxes. I had people coming up giving me cash. I had people coming up giving me um, checks. I had people stopping by during the afternoon and dropping off more and more stuff. And I saw Jesus that day in you. That's what we're here for. So we've got 50 boxes out there we're going to take to a distribution center. But more importantly, you touch lives like these. You touch lives like this one. And you touch lives of just those around us. If you guys could go down the aisles and collect those cards, start passing those cards towards the center or towards the outside. Either way, Lupe, can you go on that side? Lupe? <laughs> Jose? There you go. Thank you. So the thing is, is that we, we filled our jars. We filled our jars in a couple of different ways to serve this past week. And I want to ask you to keep filling those jars today. There's a, there's a small tree right in the center of the foyer. It has names on it. Make sure to grab those. We're going to make a difference in teachers' lives even though they're overpaid and underworked. That's a joke. We're going to make a difference in their lives. Fill out those cards. One of the best things about last Sunday night when we were filling those boxes full of toys and all kinds of stuff is one of the kids came up to me and said, can I write a personal note? Can I write a personal note to the kid that gets this? 
I said, yeah, absolutely. Then every kid was sitting and writing personal notes to the kids that are going to get those boxes. That's what we're doing. We're training up our children in the way they should go. And I'm a firm believer that more is caught than is ever taught. We can teach them. We can tell them. But what they see is what they do. All right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for just the awesome God that you are. The outrageous gifts that you give us are beyond measure. Father, we just ask that you would continue to bless this congregation. May we realize that we were put here to serve those in our community. Not those that are lesser needs than us, because we all have needs. We just, we just have different needs. But Father, the one need that we all have is the need for Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.